I think that we are on four o'clock. I want to say a special welcome to everyone here, especially Prof. Jeremy Gibbert and Prof. Um, Sijakula. Today, we are looking at sustainability and the sustainable sustainability triangle, environmental, economic, social, but more application in a workshop that Prof. Jeremy Gibbert has prepared for us on sustainable design generators. Last year, we also had presentations on this topic and you can look online on the web page for the 2023 um, workshops and you will see that there are recordings there also for workshops there's especially a very interesting one from last year by Gita Govan who's an architect on social um, sustainability and I do recommend it to everyone however Today, unfortunately, Agita could not make it, which is good news in a sense, because then we have more of Jeremy. And um, I'm going to hand over to Jeremy to take over and introduce himself and then take it away. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you very much, uh, Francine. Um, and welcome, everyone. I think um, some of you are on holiday. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, so as Francine mentioned, we were going to have uh, case studies at the end. Um, so what I will do is I'll also cover a few case studies um, towards the end. But basically, we'll have three parts. The first will look at sustainable design generation. If we want to change the way we do housing uh, and make it more sustainable, we have to change where we get our ideas, um, the methodologies we use. So that's what that first presentation is about. And hopefully you'll have questions and we can have some discussion. The second one is on criteria because the danger with something like sustainability is that it can mean all sorts of things. Um, so we need to tie it down. We need to specify targets in quantitative terms. Um, and then we need to design and test designs against those targets and show the evidence that we have actually achieved what we say we're going to achieve. So there's going to be a, a, a section on criteria. And then the last one will be case studies with some ideas. So quite visual, quite short, um, and hopefully Lots of questions. So please, as Francine mentioned, feel free to take notes. Um, we'll have a short bit of time at the end of each presentation just for clarity questions. And then at the end, we should have plenty of time for uh, discussion um, and other questions. So let me get going. Um, so what I'm going to cover is, first of all, what is sustainability? Um, what is design and then sustainable design generation. Francine, can you just confirm the slides are, are moving? They are indeed moving. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, um, let's deal with the issue of sustainability. Um, this particular definition is from the World Wildlife Fund uh, and it's very interesting because it's one of the very few quantified definitions of sustainability. They put a number, two numbers to it. Um, and the way they define sustainability is they define it in terms of an environmental ceiling, um, a set of limits that we can't go above. What they also do is define a social floor, so a limit which we can't go below. Um, and I'm going to explain both of these from the graph. So the y-axis shows the, <clears throat> the environmental, the ecological footprint. So the ecological footprint is all the, the space, the area required to support your lifestyle. So, uh, and it's measured in global hectares. So it's a physical footprint of your lifestyle. So if you drive a car a lot, produce a lot of uh, carbon dioxide, you need a correspondingly large area of vegetation to sequestrate all that carbon. 
if you eat a lot of beef, again, you need more land to support cattle that you're going to eat. So it's, it's your footprint. Um, and what the World Wildlife Fund did was take the, the entire global population and divide it by the productive surface of the earth and get to a measure, 1.8 global hectares per person. Um, and that's the top of this gray rectangle um, that you can see down here. So that forms the environmental ceiling. If you go above that, you're taking up more than your fair share. It's not sustainable. If everybody lived like that, it wouldn't be sustainable because we would very quickly deplete um, all of our natural uh, systems, uh, our productivity and capacity to absorb uh, waste. What we can then do is we can then look at the social floor um, and the social floor is measured at the Human Development Index, which is developed by the UN, which is a measure of education, health, and purchasing price parity, so jobs. Um, and it says basically there must be a minimum um, standard quality of life that uh, must be able to, to achieve. Um, and so you can see there again, um, 0.8 um, on the Human Development Index. Um, so what's very nice about this graph is it shows a gray rectangle that is can be deemed, defined as sustainable. Um, and then what you can do is you can plot countries and you can plot developmental trajectories. Um, so uh, we can see the yellow uh, circles here. These are African countries, um, as you'd expect, very low ecological footprints, not a lot of consumption, not a lot of waste or, or carbon emissions, but unacceptably low human development index. So poor levels of health, education, um, also employment, purchasing price parity. What we can then do is we can look at the other end of the graph uh, and we can see um, European countries, Canada, the States, very high ecological footprints, um, well above 1.8. So they're consuming far over their fair share um, of global resources, um, but their populations generally uh, above the human development index. So they've achieved good quality of, of life. Um, this is where we are, South Africa. Um, and you can see we fit into a very odd space, which is in neither of these quadrants. Um, and what's happened really over the last 20 years is that we've succeeded. We've been heading towards a better performance in terms of sustain sustainability, and then we've gone back. Um, and that's because our life expectancy has dropped because of HIV AIDS. Um, so what we are trying to do is, is look at where we are. Um, so if you live in, in Australia or the States, you need to develop uh, uh, strategies that push you down to this gray rectangle. If you are in Africa, in uh, DRC, Zambia, etc., you're going to be pushing in this direction. If you're South Africa, you have to do both. Um, so that definition of sustainability is very useful and it's something you can think about when you look at your, your designs. What is interesting is that um, in the last... Uh, 20 years, there's been a very strong emphasis on carbon emissions, all of the Paris, uh, Copenhagen Accords, the COPs um, have been about carbon. And, and really in the last five years, there's been a very strong shift to say we can't, we, we have to think of it um, in a much wider way. We need to kind of think about it um, in terms of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and really a societal transformation because if we just limit sustainability to carbon emissions, we are going to lose all of the other things that we talked about um, in terms of jobs, education, health, uh, water, biodiversity, et cetera. So very interesting uh, a push now from, from the UN, from the IPCC, to have a much more comprehensive, holistic approach to sustainability. And what's again be starting happening is to is is the realization that uh, we can't just 
reduce impacts. We actually have to regenerate. We have to um, fix the problems we've created. And so this comes through in the idea of regeneration. Um, and this particular graph is from Bill Reed. Um, and it shows that conventional practices right down at the bottom, high performance green buildings is, is getting better. Um, and what we actually need to do is we need to look at regenerative uh, design, restorative design, where we uh, do better. So we improve biodiversity, we improve uh, water systems, we improve uh, a lot of our natural systems, and we we work with nature. So that's the idea of regeneration. Um, you'll also come across it in things like energy, water, um, etc. In terms of this idea of of net positive, you get net zero which means that all of the energy that's used in that building is produced on site. So there's no need for a power line uh, to bring in power. So that's a net zero building. A net positive building means that you are generating sufficient power to actually export and help people around you. Um, and you can apply this to energy, you can apply this to water, you can apply this to other things. Um, and really, that's where we're heading. That's where the cutting edge of sustainable green building uh, is going. Um, and you'll see this uh, in some of the rating tools um, and targets that we'll talk talk about uh, a little bit later. So before we get into kind of ideas, um, the very first thing is that if you want to rethink how you do things, um, you actually need to change the tools you use, the, the methods you use in terms of design, um, and, and look at where you draw inspiration from. So this quote from Albert Einstein is that if we carry on designing exactly the same way, we're just going to carry on designing unsustainable housing. So we need to rethink uh, and use different tools, be more experimental. And I think the idea in this competition is very much about exploring. It is, is, is where do we get our inspiration from? Can we develop some of the tools that will enable us to design very high performance, uh, sustainable designs? Um, and, and that's fundamentally one of the things we want um, in this uh, competition is that exploration. And if you can develop very good tools, it'll set you up very well uh, for, for the future. So, um, the last thing that I want to say is 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 really the process uh, of design. Um, a lot of you do it, um, but if you are asked to describe it, you might have some difficulty. Uh, so this particular diagram is from the Design Museum, and it shows a process that you can work through, and a process that most designers work through, architects uh, work through, is first of all, really understand what the problem is. Um, particularly talking it through with your clients, developing a brief, um, define it. So what are the key issues? What are the key priorities? Um, and that's your brief. That's where you're going to set uh, some of your targets in terms of sustainability, what sort of performance you want to achieve. Then you start designing. You generate ideas, you generate uh, designs. Um, and maybe you do it with others. So if it's an integrated design team, you'd involve a water engineer, um, a structural engineer, um, civil engineer, bio, biodiversity specialists, and you develop this very integrated co-designed uh, building and site. Um, and then the last thing that you do is, is say, is that really the best possibility, uh, the best option? Um, and you test it and you'd refine it. So you might have three different versions um, and then pick one and then refine it. And the way you're choosing the right design, the optimum design is checking it back against the define, the, the challenge um, and measuring it. So what we're going to talk about today um, is, is this process. Discover, define, develop, deliver. And there's what's called a methods bank. It's where do we get our ideas? Where do we get 
uh, our inspiration for design. So this particular workshop, the first one, is going to be what 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 our source of design, what's our methods bank, and then the second one that I'm going to cover um, in in about 10, 15 minutes is the deliver. Um, how do we test? What criteria are we going to use to, to really uh, ensure that we really have an evidence-based uh, design that, that is underpinned by real performance? It's not just wishful thinking. So let's start with where do we, what can we use for um, ideas? Um, and it's important, your houses, your homes are for people. Um, so the very first thing that you need to do is you need to get into the shoes of your occupants. So the people are going to live in these homes, the children, old people, youth, women, men, people with disabilities, people with different cultures, maybe rural people who have moved into town. Um, a lot of them may be concerned about livelihoods, about jobs, incomes. So you need to kind of understand those financial issues uh, and worries and how your housing works as a financial system. You need to think about the whole Maslow's uh, hierarchy. Uh, what are their needs? Um, very basic physiological needs about food, safety, security, love, belonging, self-esteem, but also fulfillment. Um, so things like um, education, uh, being able to socialize, talk through ideas, explore things. Um, and how does your design, how does your human settlement really uh, understand the population that you are accommodating um, and talk to uh, and provide for all of these different uh, needs? The next one is uh, one that comes from observation. So when you are designing one of the most useful things to do is to walk around the site um, and really understand the site and see how it works what currently works because what you can do is you've already got evidence that something works you've got evidence that a, a shop works in a particular place because it's been there for 10 years and it's successful um, you've got evidence that a route works, a pedestrian route works, because everybody uses it. So one of the very first things that you can do is you can go and do an assessment of the site and the surroundings um, and really understand pedestrian movements, things like trade, retail, where children play, where people gather, um, and understand those patterns um, and then use that, reinforce, replicate, um, use them in the way you design. The um, picture on the left, which looks a bit like a footprint, um, is a study I did on informal settlements, not informal settlements, informal trade in the CBD in Pretoria. Mm -hmm. um, and what I did was I mapped um, the intensity of, of informal trade. So the number of people selling uh, maguinha, maize, whatever it is, all the different types of, of products. Um, and, and you could see very clearly that if you wanted to support informal trade, um, you needed to work with what's there uh, and build and support that. Um, the, the picture at the bottom um, is a very interesting study on uh, what happens within informal settlements. Um, so this particular study looked at all of the different activities that support each other within an informal settlement. So it's, it's, it's selling of food, but it's also hairdressing, it's cloth making, it's recycling, it's repairs. Um, and there's this incredible network of, of reinforcing economic ties. It's an ecosystem. Um, and again, if you're going to work within an area uh, where there's already people living, there's already activity, you want to work with that, reinforce it, um, and scale it up, and and make it make it work better. So the next uh, idea that you might use for inspiration is just to think about the capabilities, the characteristics of a site. Um, so you've got your defined area. Francine has drawn your footprint um, of your site. Um, what happens to that? over the period of 12 months, over different seasons. 
Um, and one of the things that happens is that rain falls on it. And if you have 600 millimeters of rainfall, you can multiply your hectares by 600 millimeters um, and you'll find you've got a lot of water. Um, and so you can understand what's going to happen to that water and how you can use it as part of your design um, and look at the runoff. The same thing in terms of sunshine. Um, you'll have uh, you know, X kilowatt hours um, at different times in the year. Uh, and again, all of that is something you can use if you're looking at sustainability. Shade, wind, the airflow, vegetation, materials, noise, the geology, uh, the topography of the site. There are all sorts of things that you can use really to start generating um, and using in your design. So the top picture is Khaboroni in Botswana. Um, and this is a UN study that looked at rainwater capability uh, within Khaboroni um, in terms of, of using that rainwater for the city. The picture below is from uh, Durban. Um, and basically what you can do is you can find your site and it'll generate the potential of your site in terms of photovoltaic power. So what are the kilowatt hours, et cetera. Um, and you can do this for your site if you want to, um, because that particular map there is, is, is where your site is. So it's very easy to do. Um, and you've got a whole set of figures to look at the capability, the solar capability uh, of your site and how you can then spread that over your site, look at roofs, uh, et cetera. Leading in from that is the idea of form generation, is that you actually shape your buildings. You lay out your buildings uh, from the characteristics of the site. So the topography of the site, where there's valleys, where there's uh, solar um, access, the shade, you, you actually shape the forms of your building. So you work with the topography, solar, shade patterns, air movement, um, water flows, vegetation, so existing vegetation enhanced, um, having um, <clears throat> nature really inter intermingled within the, the site, looking at how you can create mic microclimates, how you can enhance those, uh, things like views, very important. Um, so some examples, um, the top image is a design um, for a new university, Park Bit in Mallorca. Uh, and really the whole form was generated from the topography, but also to ensure that each individual room, each individual uh, apartment or lecture room had access to good daylight, had access to uh, airflow, had access to views. Um, and that's why you got this very organic shape uh, because it was generated by the topography. The one below um, is, is, is similar, is that uh, the whole shape of a fairly high density building um, was generated really by getting good access to daylight views, um, having uh, space that can be planted, etc. Passive environmental control, hopefully a lot of you have had lectures on this. Um, and it's a very important set of skills to, to learn because uh, when you leave, one of the key things that you need to be able to do is design buildings that use very low energy um, and are very comfortable throughout the year. So the first thing that you have to do is really understand the local climate. So you need to understand uh, temperatures through the year, maximum minimums, uh, what happens at night, what happens during the day, what, what are the air flows? Um, and then you need to understand what is going on in your buildings. So if it's a gym, uh, there's lots of activities, uh, people are not wearing much, so the clothes are, are low, um, and really have this picture throughout a full year of all the things that are, are going on. Um, and once you have got both of those sets of information, you can then develop very responsive passive environmental control strategies. Um, and there's very nice software. Again, I think a lot of your lecturers probably uh, have, have told you about this, where you can plot uh, every day of the year um, on a graph 
uh, and then you can look at how you can bring um, that all of those temperatures into the comfort envelope um, so that you use uh, direct uh, sunshine in winter to warm up spaces in, in summer. You might use high thermal mass cross ventilation to cool spaces down uh, and to keep them comfortable. So again, there's a whole set of skills, evidence-based um, approaches that you can use here. You can model it um, and that will generate the form of the building. Uh, it'll generate the layouts. Uh, it'll generate where you put windows. It'll generate where you put doors. It'll generate what materials you have to use. If you have to use high thermal mass materials, you there's certain types that you then use uh, in that particular case. What is also um, important is to think about um, how spaces change over time. Um, because they're not static. Um, we all think of, of buildings as kind of plans and elevations, but actually they're flows, the things that go on around buildings. Um, and you need to become familiar with those flows and be able to be very happy to generate and draw uh, and, and represent those um, images because things happen after rain, there's flows, temperature, the daytime temperatures change outside, they change inside the buildings. Uh, we have uh, water flows, etc. So this particular graph uh, shows this. Um, and it shows the example of a corrugated uh, tin roof. What happens is that you get very heavy rainfall. Um, the runoff very quickly peaks because all of that water runs straight into the gutters and then into the stormwater systems. Um, and that's why you get flooding, because you get these huge outflows from many sites across a neighborhood, across a city, and you get flooding. The alternative way to design this uh, roof is to use a turf roof, uh, 300 to 200 millimeters of turf with grass or, or planting uh, on top. Um, rain falls on that, it gets absorbed. So, you know, a good... Uh, amount of water gets absorbed and then it gradually trickles off um, and you get a much lower peak. So this B might be a third of the, the scale uh, of the peak flow that you, you got with a corrugated tin roof. And again, this is fundamental to sustainable design is understanding how buildings work with climate. Um, and as we get much heavier rainfall, um, we need to be much cleverer with our buildings and they need to be far more responsive to cope with, with future change. We also need to think about how we uh, represent buildings. Um, so we conventionally talk about plans, elevations, but actually some of the most important parts of buildings are systems. So there's an input, there's water that comes in from main supply, it goes into indoor usage, it might be used for flushing toilets, for the kitchen, uh, showers, etc. And then that goes out to um, main sewage. A bit of it might go for irrigation or to wash cars. Um, and we can show that. We can show that flow of, of uh, water. We can also show the quality of water. So obviously you get black water from uh, toilets. Um, and the water that goes into sewage is black water. It's It can't be used um, easily. It has to be cleaned. Um, and there's replenishment of, of groundwater. <clears throat> now, once you start using tools like this to represent systems, you can start being very creative um, at designing far more efficient or loopier systems. Um, so you can say, where do our resources come from? Where's our inputs? Um, so instead of mains water, we might use rainwater. Um, and then again, within the building, how does this water, how is this water used? Uh, so if it's used in showers, as if it's used in wash hand basins, it becomes gray water, but it's still good quality. It's good quality uh, and it's enough. The, the quality is good enough to be used to flush toilets. Uh, and then you can then direct it to treatment and you might even have a site 
uh, a system on site where you then uh, allow this to be used for irrigation. So if you've got an ecological um, wetland, for instance, you can then use that water for irrigation and then it can replenish uh, groundwater systems. So the important thing here is to think about how you represent sustainable design, how you develop sustainable design. Don't just draw <laughs> plans. Don't just draw sections and elevations. Think about the systems because fundamentally, if these systems work and you're familiar with how to use these tools, then you'll create far more sustainable uh, loopy designs which have far fewer inputs and far fewer waste uh, outputs. Circular built environments. Uh, so this is a very interesting uh, development. Um, increasingly, it's, it's a kind of natural way of designing sustainable buildings uh, because a lot of the inherent thinking helps with sustainability. So it's about designing out waste, regenerating natural systems, uh, sharing uh, physical facilities, optimizing those facilities, looping um, the systems, virtualizing, which means that you may not need um, to have a classroom because you can have virtual um, Zoom teaching uh, exchanges so that um, you use things far more efficiently. You don't, not every household has to buy a lawnmower. You actually have one lawnmower and you share it. Um, so I'll go through this in a bit more detail um, later, but uh, the circular economy has got a lot of, I think, inspiring ideas that will drive um, how you design sustainable housing. There's lots of rich uh, ideas. And again, you can look at this for inspiration. The idea of locality. Uh, very important. I think when we think about sustainability, we need to kind of think really about kind of making sure that we have the local systems working, the local environment working, the local economy working. Uh, so we need to understand local materials, skills, manufacturing, who's going to maintain your buildings uh, and look after them so that they work very efficiently, they don't decay or, or become... Uh, derelict uh, over time um, and you know how do you make that work so again uh, think in terms of the site what what is within 50 kilometers of the site what are some of the skills you can develop uh, and use um, locally so that you don't have um, huge transport impacts you create jobs locally you create small entrepreneurs uh, manufacturing hubs, repair hubs, uh, et cetera. Planning for the future. Um, we all think that we know what's going to happen in the future. And the reality is that um, even within the space of five to 10 years, things change radically. So this particular site that you're working with may change altogether. It may suddenly become um, under a huge amount of pressure to become co more commercial. Will your housing be able to accommodate that change and become more commercial, light industrial, et cetera? So the change in the area, but also the change in the building. So what if families change, there's additional children or there's grandparents that join, how do you design for that change? Um, and there's two or three nice ideas. There's Stuart Brand's uh, book, um, which is that lower diagram, which talks about layers in buildings uh, and how you can design buildings so that you can allow different parts of the building to change easily without having to knock it down. Uh, so the idea of very flexible, uh, adaptable buildings. The top diagram talks about scenarios. So instead of this very linear uh, approach, where you only have one use in mind, you know, a school, a house, you may say, well, the bottom floor might be a work unit. And so we need to design that to enable that to happen very easily. Um, and that building in that flexibility and adaptability is very useful because you then create much better long lasting uh, buildings um, and you don't have to knock the buildings down. 
So I'm reaching the end. Um, the last thing to think about is really to start exploring um, how people, how you live and work. So right at the beginning, I talked about societal transformation. Do we all need to work from, you know, seven or eight in the morning till four or five in the afternoon, commute in and out, uh, children go to school, um, follow this, this throughout the week? Um, or are there different ways of, of living, different ways of, of working? Um, and so there's some very interesting experimental communities that have developed um, that are using their buildings to live far more efficiently. Um, so this particular example is BedZ. It's in the outskirts of London. Um, and by drawing together people who think uh, and share the same principles and ideals, uh, they have hugely reduced uh, a lot of their consumption. So much less energy, much less water, uh, much lower waste production, um, where they obtain uh, their food from, they grow their own food, community facilities, they share a lot of the facilities. So things like cars, community facilities, so they don't each have um, bits of equip equipment or, um, you know, they, they, they pooled a lot of their resources. So again, a useful one to look, up, look at when you're designing, uh, to think about how you design not just your buildings, but the community and the structures that govern and live within that community. The last one is once you've defined your performance figures um, and your targets, um, then using particular modeling processes. So you can model on Excel, you can model um, and simulate uh, using, there's a whole range of different software, energy software, lighting software, water software, et cetera. And so you can define your parameters and then you can pick the, the optimum uh, shapes and forms for that particular performance. So this particular example uh, shows how um, you define particular performance in terms of daylight, energy, and views. Um, and then you use uh, simulation software um, to try many different um, uh, footprints of buildings, um, facade systems, to get to the optimum uh, lowest uh, performance, so the best performance, um, and that's what you use. So it's a form of evolution, uh, survival of the fittest. So the, the, the highest performance design is what succeeds. Um, and you then say, this is a sustainable design because out of the 50 different versions, this is the one that actually performs best and I've tested it and I've, I can show you the figures. Good. Okay. I think that's that's it. Um, I don't know if there's any um, questions. I would just like to start um, by saying, Jeremy, thank you so very much. That was very insightful. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and then, yes, students, please, any questions, any interaction? I'm seeing some clapping hands. Thank you. Thank you, students. That looks great. If there's anyone we'll, with a question, please ask. Yeah, we'll, we will come back. We'll come back. But I think hopefully you've written some things down. Um, so we can come back. But if there's none, let me just have a look. I don't think there's anyone. No, there's no no questions. So let me carry on. And then I think at the end, hopefully there's some, some other questions. Okay, um, Francine, can you just tell me whether you can see sustainable performance criteria? Okay, absolutely good. can. Yes. So I hope I hope I'm not overloading everybody with information. But the the point that Francine made is that these presentations will be available, so you can go back in your own time um, and have a look at have a look at them. So. What I'm going to talk about here is, is really the targets, the numbers, uh, because if you're going to claim that your building is sustainable, 
you need to talk about that in terms of the environmental ceiling that we talked about and the social floor. That's the context. You know, that's why we're doing sustainability is we're doing it because we have to achieve those targets in terms of um, sustainable development goals and climate change. Okay, so that's really important. Um, so what are the tools? What are the characteristics of buildings? So again, I'm not going to, this is, there's a lot of detail here uh, and I'm just going to show you uh, some of the characteristics that are particularly important for say, uh, energy or water, um, just so that you you can see them, um, and then talk a little bit about uh, sustainable design targets. Um, and last of all, then show how this bit fits in after um, your design generation. So after your, your toolbox, you use this to test your ideas. So the criteria I'm going to use deliberately um, are mixed. We've got five environmental, we've got five economic, we've got five social, uh, because it links back to um, the, the ceiling um, and the floor that we talked about. Um, so it's a holistic set of measures um, that we're going to just talk through fairly quickly. So starting with the first one, um, energy, everybody knows it's a key issue because of carbon emissions. Um, and, and so the target that you are aiming for, the key objective, is that you want to minimize the amount of energy you use um, and ideally um, use all your energy should come from renewable energy uh, sources. Um, so that's your objective. Um, right at the bottom, you'll see a set of targets. So you don't have to use all of these. These are really um, ideas that you can use. So different... Uh, metrics you can use. So we talked about net positive energy. Um, if you produce 10% more energy than you need, your target would be net positive energy of a 10%, um, for, for example. If you achieve uh, all of your renewable, your energy consumption is all from renewable uh, energy sources on site, you would have 100% renewable energy sources. Um, hopefully a lot of you know about 10400XA uh, and you know what the targets are, the minimum requirements for building regulations by law. Um, so you know what they have to be in terms of kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. Um, again, you can show that you have exceeded that by however much. Um, and you can also take it back to per person. So if you've got high density um, housing, that might be a better way to show it. So you've got a choice. Um, and again, if you find other measures, most welcome to use it. The important thing about targets is that they give you something to aim for. And if you don't have something to aim for, um, it's very difficult to achieve very high performance yeah. and to to make the claim that it's it's a sustainable high performance building. So what are the things that you would look at? Um, again, a lot of you hopefully are very familiar with orientating buildings, the layout of buildings so that you have good access to daylight, um, airflow, the building footprint, the construction of the roof in terms of insulation, uh, wall construction, again, uh, U values, um, R values, the floor construction, window to wall ratios, so how much of the Glazing um, covers your facade systems. Uh, the design for airflow, which is what this diagram is about, is how do you make sure there's very good cross ventilation um, and very well ventilated spaces. Your internal uh, lighting, your external lighting, uh, lighting, your equipment power density. You know, if you fill your building up with a lot of equipment, people will tend to use it, so you'll consume more energy. So if you use very efficient um, things like microwaves, there will be less machinery to switch on and leave on. Um, so you, your, your energy consumption reduces. Food cooking, water heating, renewable energy in terms of the, the roof, solar water heaters, uh, etc. So all, all kind of hopefully very familiar. The same thing goes for water. 
Um, so you're trying to minimize your water consumption uh, from main supply. So you want it to be very efficient and ideally um, get a, a good proportion of your water, maybe all your water from rainwater harvesting um, and have very efficient toilets, uh, wash hand basins, showers, um, landscaping, um, maybe have a gray water system where you take all of the relatively clean water and use it for irrigation or use it for, for toilets. So again, the criteria are very similar. Uh, net positive water, where your water sources come from, how much comes from, for instance, uh, rainwater, what proportion of your water is reused at least once uh, to flush toilets, uh, et cetera. Next one is waste and emissions. Uh, so you're wanting to minimize the amount of waste generated by your design. Um, and again, you know, how do you, do you actually take waste from neighboring areas um, and, and recycle that on site? In which case it becomes a net kind of positive um, target. What are the waste production figures in terms of kilograms per person? Um, and you can define a lot of these targets and you can say, this is what I'm going to aim to achieve. Um, but if you do, uh, you need to show evidence that you're really going to achieve that. Um, and what are the mechanic mechanisms? You know, are you going to have reusable containers? Are you, how you are going to avoid packaging? Um, a lot of those sorts of things become very important. So you need to show evidence and strategies that you're actually going to achieve that. Um, and this diagram is very useful uh, because it shows that recycling is actually probably the worst thing to do. The best is to refuse. Um, so avoid the waste in the first place. <clears throat> Materials. Um, so you want to minimize uh, impacts of uh, construction materials. Um, and this starts with just the size of your building. So if you've got a huge building with one person in it, you're going to consume a lot of resources to build that building. So meter squared per person uh, is important and you need to define what a sufficiency target is. Ideally, you reuse existing buildings, you reuse materials, um, you reuse materials from uh, demolish, demolition. Um, and so you've got large amounts of recycled content within your steel, within your block work, um, etc. Um, you avoid hazardous materials, uh, anything that will affect human health um, or has a negative effect on, for instance, um, the ozone layer. Um, so, so you need to understand what chemicals are in your plywood, um, in your paints, in your carpets, uh, etc. Um, and ideally, you would be looking really at kind of bio-based materials. So materials that can be grown, um, that support sustainable farming, create jobs, um, and then at the end of their useful life uh, can be composted um, and, and go back to nature. So you don't have um, a lot of these materials that create problems uh, and, and pollution in future. Uh, biocapacity, so biocapacity is, is really the idea uh, that's linked to global hectares, saying that you want to make sure that the productive use of land is as high as possible. Uh, so you retain and master your vegetation, you retain natural systems, um, and, and so what you are aiming here is to have as much, as many green, you know, as much green roof parks, uh, biodiversity ecosystems so that you've got this very resilient uh, set of natural systems that sequestrate uh, carbon. So again, your targets here might be that you actually increase uh, vegetation on site. What's the space that's covered in vegetation? What's your species richness? Um, if you want to do some interesting calculations, you can look at on-site carbon sequestration, uh, quite complex, but you can do it. You, you can, there's particular types of plant. Spec boom, for instance, has very high sequestration uh, potential. So there are certain plants that are very good at uh, sequestrating, absorbing carbon. Um, and, and so you can look at these figures and you can present that um, in terms of your design. 
We're now moving to uh, economic systems. Um, so people like to move around, they need to move goods around. Um, and what you're trying to do is make that very energy efficient and so hopefully also support health. So mobility in terms of walking and cycling, um, using cargo bikes where you move goods around using non-motorized transport, electric uh, motorbikes, electric vehicles. Um, and again, there's some interesting measures. So the UN uses, for instance, um, a measure of kilometers per hectare. Um, so kilometers of, of walking route, safe walking route, or kilometers of cycling routes per hectare. Um, and you can say my particular design achieves X kilometers per hectare. And that's why it's a very uh, transport uh, a green um, efficient uh, site. Um, so again, you can look at a lot of those things and you can present your design uh, with quantitative measures behind it. Uh, so it's not a claim that's false. You know, you, you'll do the measurements and you'll show the performance. Resource use. So you again, you've got 10 hectares. Um, how are you going to make sure that you really use those 10 hectares well uh, for the site? Um, so it comes back to what Francine talked about right at the beginning. What are your densities? How are you going to arrange it so that you get good sustainable densities? Um, you need to look at building areas. Um, and what you might then find is that you have space that you can include uh, renewable energy systems, so roofs um, that that might be available, and also food gardens. So again, you use the space in a very intensive way to reduce inputs. So you remember that uh, idea of a circular economy, you're reducing what needs to be brought in and the waste that's being taken off uh, in the way you design uh, your space and your intensity of use uh, of that space. Management, very important. Um, so what you are aiming to do here is to design buildings uh, and environments that are very easy to use uh, and to use in a sustainable way. So if we want people to recycle, uh, make it very easy, uh, make it work. Um, if we want people to be very energy efficient, um, show the energy consumption on a cell phone. Um, so that they're reminded about that there's a little alarm that might go off, for instance. Um, if you want to give incentives to people, show the amount of uh, energy that's generated from uh, renewable energy systems. Um, and again, the technology is now very cheap, very available in terms of the Internet of Things. Um, so a lot of this is, is going to be very important for you to design with when you... Uh, you, you work in your careers, uh, and a lot of this uh, you can start experimenting now um, and, and looking at. Another very important part is just to think about residence association and working with your neighbors. So again, you really need to have, you know, 100 individual car parking spaces, or can you have 50 that are pooled? Um, and you have a, 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 a pool of cars. And you can only get there if you work together, if there's a management structure that enables the systems um, to work together. So services and products, we all need uh, food, we need uh, furniture, we need clothing, we need our buildings to be repaired. Um, we need a drill to drill into the wall to hang up a picture. Um, all of these are services and products that we need, you know, every day throughout the week, throughout the year. Um, and there's an opportunity, if we think through these services and products, to make them very sustainable and to enable them to create jobs uh, and local entrepreneurs. Um, so this, the whole idea of urban agriculture, local markets, uh, local manufacturing, um, small scale manufacturing locally, um, a lot of building maintenance repairs, equipment hire, um, product as a service, and have that local so that, again, you make sure that uh, your, uh, um, your, your, your building um, is, is, again, part of this ecosystem of services and products um, and, and is extremely efficient. 
Uh, so resource efficient, very low waste. The local economy. Um, if you support the local economy, you create jobs locally. Um, children growing up in that area don't feel like they have to go to the city or in another area. They can start a business. They can work into a particular uh, local industry. Um, you have high levels of trust. Um, if one area, uh, if it's very diversified, if one area drops because of the world economy, um, then another area can help take up some of the slack. So a diversified local economy is very important for sustainability in terms of just keeping people's livelihoods going um, and enabling them to survive through the kind of peaks and troughs of uh, different economic cycles. Um, so the things you can provide, um, you can look at how you support local entrepreneurs uh, through locally sourced materials and products. Uh, you can create small rental units, so you can support uh, small entrepreneurs, manufacturers locally. Um, and places like London have done this very successfully. They've had the arches uh, under the train, train tracks have been used really to generate a lot of small businesses because they've had very cheap rent um, and created you know, lots of innovative new uh, industries. Um, so again, using local contractors, um, notices boards. Um, very interesting one is the idea of local currencies. Um, you now, with cell phones, uh, with cryptocurrency, you can create currency for a neighborhood. Um, and so you can trade between your neighbors and you can recycle money locally. So it doesn't go to ShopRite or it doesn't go to Woolworths. Um, it is recycled locally. Um, and people get wealthier, um, and, and there's a diversified, very strong local economy. Um, access, very important. So if we think about kind of everyday life, uh, children go to school, you go to work, um, you need to go and get some shopping, um, you need to go to the post office, you need to pay your tax, uh, all of those sorts of things. Um, is incredibly wasteful in many cities because you spend hours driving around, catching buses, walking, etc. So it, it produces a lot of carbon emissions and it's wasteful. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that you can do in the design is make sure that those sorts of activities, those sorts of needs are within walking distance. Um, you can also use the internet um, and make sure that a lot of services are accessible in terms of the internet. Um, and and develop that locally. Um, so again, you your design can show how you achieve that to avoid this uh, huge amount of commuting, where the situation where you have, you know, parents who travel four hours a day and kids come home and hardly see their parents uh, at all. Health very important. Um, you need to make sure your environment is supportive of health uh, and productivity. Very obvious things like water, diets, thermally comfortable. So a lot of our informal settlements are, are thermally very uncomfortable. Um, and people, um, there's a lot of, of uh, disease, uh, ill health that's associated with extremely hot uh, spaces and very cold spaces. Uh, Poor ventilation, so clean air, very important, daylight, views, uh, exercise, recreation, clinics, no hazards. Um, so hazards, um, in many cities, this is not an issue, but in South Africa, we do have hazards. So it's things like being mugged, uh, you know, and, and how do you look at security uh, and health and safety in the design of your building and how do you, your, your, your layout and how do you prove uh, that you've addressed this uh, effectively. Education. Um, so for a competitive economy, you have to have very well educated people. And it's not just primary, secondary uh, and university. Is It's the idea of ongoing learning is that throughout people's lives, about 5% of the time of their working time should be dedicated to uh, education, to ongoing learning. Um, and that's a kind of benchmark internationally. If you look at uh, big companies, some of them will have higher than 5%, but 
is what's required. So if you've got 100 people, um, you need to have enough space so that 5% of those employees can access training at any one point. So again, you can design this into your uh, settlement. You can make sure there's good primary schools, secondary schools, access to ongoing learning, uh, libraries, notice boards. Uh, you need uh, education about the buildings, so building user manuals, uh, and training with your contractors. You can use construction as a vehicle for construction training so that people can leave um, with good skills that they can then use uh, elsewhere. Inclusion, again, this is also becoming much more important. Uh, it's the idea that we've got a very diverse society. In South Africa, we have a huge diversity. We've got different cultures, uh, ages, um, and, and people with disabilities. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to be inclusive. Um, our constitution requires uh, human settlements to be inclusive. So we need to think about the transport systems. We need to think about schools, local facilities, make sure they're accessible. We then need to look, think through the detailed design of buildings themselves. So pathways between buildings, entrances, uh, lobbies, controls on windows, doors, bathrooms, uh, kitchens, you know, if there's, are they wheelchair accessible? How do they work? Um, big one is affordability. You know, if you design all your buildings to be very expensive, you are excluding a huge sector of the population because it's too expensive. So this inclusion measure <coughs> you can use to, to think through what are the characteristics that you're going to design into your buildings, and then you can prove them, prove that. You can actually highlight them and show that you've developed an inclusive um, design. Um, so again, there's a lot of information on this, but it's very important in terms of sustainability, because if you don't do this, you then have uh, waste you have buildings uh, for one set of people and another set of buildings for others. Uh, and in fact, the infrastructure is extremely uh, uh, wasteful. So I think this is the last one, um, social cohesion. So social cohesion is the idea that um, if we trust each other, if we work together, we can be far more efficient as a community, as a society. So uh, in neighborhoods where crime is not an issue, people wouldn't spend money on security system, electric fences, on walls, on burglar bars, etc. And all of that money could go into a useful uh, into useful resources, you better education, better parks, uh, etc. So how do we design neighborhoods that have higher levels of social cohesion, lower crime, lower distrust? Um, and one of these things is 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 really to have that interaction. So easy interaction, you know your neighbors, you have shared spaces, um, there's residence associations, uh, etc. So again, there's some targets that you can aim for um, and, and you can show how you've designed this into your uh, particular uh, competition entry. So I'm almost at the end. Um, one of the things that you can do if you want to research this area is you can look at the uh, green building rating tools. Um, a lot of what I've talked about is in those green building rating tools. So they give you uh, protocols, they give you the metrics, uh, they give you quick calculators that you can use. Um, and there's a whole range of different calculators. A lot of them you can download um, and use. So that just gives you a bit more detail uh, if you're interested. So really to finish off on um, what I've been talking about um, is this stage here, the deliver uh, component. So we talked about discovering. So it's 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 understanding the site. Um, it's talking to your users, understanding your users, setting your challenge, your targets. Um, for this competition, you need to set very high targets. Um, 
don't set low targets because um, then it's easy to achieve. Set challenging high targets uh, so that it's difficult to achieve and you really have a challenge in the way you design <coughs> your buildings. <coughs> um, develop your solutions and then measure your designs against the criteria I've talked about and use that evidence to show that you've got a sustainable design. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Okay, um, that's it. But <coughs> Francina, I don't know if there's... Yo, Prof. Jeremy, that was very, very interesting. Thank you so very much. I'm sure that all the students found that extremely beneficial. I am really looking forward to questions. Um, last year, we had a lot of students that were very rowdy on this competition. And I, <laughs> I understand that not talking a lot means you might be polite or you don't want to be, but don't want to stand out. But your submission is anonymous. So... Um, Please do ask questions. Um, any concerns as well? Some of you might have started with your with your projects already, your proposals. Some of you might be struggling working in a team. There might be lecturers online wishing to ask a question. The floor is open. It might be they don't want to give away their the strategies, uh, keeping them secret. Which is good as well. <laughs> Which is fine, exactly. Well. Uh, so uh, keeping keeping them undercover so that uh, nobody else has the same, same ideas. Oh. Okay. Um, well, let me, oh, here's here's one. I think there's Hugo. There's a hand. hand. Yeah, Hugo yeah. Skippers, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, just um, yeah. Firstly, also just thank you so much for uh, the workshop so far. Um, I think they were very uh, knowledgeable um, and informative. Um, but I just wanted to uh, hear if you guys can maybe just chat about cost again. So, say you have like a very because uh, I know we have spoken about it um, in the previous. Uh, workshops um, but I thought like uh, if there's a possibility that you guys can maybe just chat about cost um, so say you have a design and it is sustainable um, but uh, you're at a, at a cost how should we then uh, decide okay great we have this fantastic um, uh, design and it meets this and this requirement and therefore it's good but then you then you see it's gonna cost like enormous amount of money. Okay, do you then change the plan and then maybe like um, also make it sustainable, but uh, you know at a at a lower cost? Yeah. So that's. I the... think that. You know, that's definitely a, an excellent question. I would have a go at that. Convince convince the panel of judges why this cost that you are incurring is important. Perhaps show it over the life life um, life expectancy of your building. Say this building will be here for 40 years, 80 years, 100 years. It will be multi-generational. And therefore, this cost now is important to mitigate costs later. You know, convince the panel why it I is important. Okay, yeah. That's, yeah. okay. With thank you. With a diagram. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, Jeremy, that's true. I, I, I think the three, uh, Francine has given a very good answer, but I think they're kind of three three key issues. Um, the first is, how do you measure cost? Um, so, for instance, if it's slightly more expensive, but you create a lot of local jobs, um, then you might find, you know, that government will be very happy to give you a subsidy. So there's a way of kind of cross um subsidizing so always think about what are you measuring uh, there's a whole area called ecological economics um where you need to 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 quantify so for instance the cost of waste a, a lot of it isn't actually costed that transportation of that waste to landfill um so so do your you know very wide 
look at look at what you're costing and 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 how you're defining it so that you you capture some of the things that are maybe not costed and not reflected that's the first thing the second thing um really is this issue of affordability um and in south africa it's very important um we are excluding a huge proportion of our populations and that's why there are informal settlements on the perimeter um because rental space housing is too expensive um and all big cities have this uh, many people can't live in london because it's too expensive um and so it's exclusionary um and so how do you get around this um and the whole idea of kind of co-living uh, much more efficient spaces there's all sorts of things you can do very nice experimental models um that you can come across um and and experiment with the third thing is the point that francine made which is that something um that looks expensive seen over its life cycle may become very cheap so if we look at the cost of electricity uh originally our panels our renewable systems were incredibly expensive um and now the payback period is you know five years ten years um rainwater harvesting gray water systems it's three or four years um there's no bank account that will give you you know 40 percent return on your investment whereas a lot of these systems will you know an led lighting system will pay pay itself off within one or two years um so use um economic arguments if you're going to go a very uh expensive route and you're worried about it um that's a very useful skill to use because you're going to use that when you talk to your clients and the developers uh, etc any any other questions i just want to say that was a great question yeah it was good students lecturers professors that are online please do ask away Much quieter um, this year than last year. Last year it was very <laughs> there were a lot of lot of uh, uh, yeah. very chatty. Um, yeah. But good. perhaps I will say something. I'm assuming most of the students online currently are third years. Your second years, your first years can also participate. If you're from yeah. a school where you only have a degree in your fourth year or a higher diploma in your fourth year, you can also participate. Um, you can have multi. Um, your groups um yeah i think the other thing is you know this is this is is a new area some of the things that i've covered up are a little bit controversial that they're, they're different so if you disagree strongly with it it's a very good thing to raise and let's have a discussion um so i think you know feel free also um to to do that if there's any particular um, reactions? Um, yeah, I think if I could have a reaction, I would love yeah, a step-by-step step on how to <laughs> use some of these um, online apps and models and so on and so forth. Me personally. So yeah. the Prof. Jeremy, there's definitely a paper to write there. But I'm also yeah. looking forward to students showing, showing in the submissions their processes. Like we took this unit, we did this, we took it here, we assessed it here. This is what is the upper. We have a question. Is it possible Pumalele. if we can have plans? Your yes, um, Pumulelu, um, an existing RDP on site plans for it. Yes, there is online. There are sources for RDP plans. I've got one in a bookshelf right here. So what I'll do is I will put it on a Google Drive. That reminds me. I'm quickly going to put a um link on the chat for a google drive and then i'll place some information in there the reason i'm giving you this link to the google drive is that these workshops for this week will be a bit longer or will take a bit longer to be placed onto the to the web page so if you go to this google drive i'll add one or two plans of an existing rdp house a jpeg or a pdf into that file but if you do a search online you will see that there are quite a few examples of rdp houses that you can take and then improve on yeah, yeah. let me just quickly get that link folks that is an excellent question as well 
Good. Um, shall I then carry on and then we'll we'll have a bit of time. OK, let me do the last one and then um, we'll have a bit of time um, at the end. Right, uh, let's have a look. So Jeremy, you're giving us a master class to this evening. Thank you I'm, so very I'm, much. Uh, I'm pack, packing it in so, so that um oh. we have we have uh, we can we can uh, okay, here we go, here we go. Okay. Um can I yeah, can I just check that you can see that? The case studies. I can absolutely see it, yeah, Prof. Good, okay, thank you. Um, so maybe to stimulate a bit of question, what's the most sustainable housing design? Some reactions from everybody that we can think of. If you had to name, a, name an example. Everyone? Just you say it out loud, put it in the chat. Type type something in into the chat. Let's let's have a look at what if if uh, you had to put something down now uh, in terms of the most sustainable housing, what would you put down? Okay, there's anyone anyone done that in terms of the chat? Yes, we have PV systems. Okay, a, a PV system. Any other? Um, any examples, any particular housing uh, case studies, examples that you would come across? Any others? Anyone live Nothing. in a very sustainable house, <laughs> for instance? Okay. Um, I thought you're all working on this. You have done a huge amount of research and you could name four really good examples. Um, Okay, so maybe, maybe, uh, is there, have we got any more? Francine, any others coming through? Not yet. Here we have, we have a zero carbon okay. homes. Um, okay, good. Shiguru ban refugee housing, not super okay. sustainable, but cheap and green, which is a very interesting. Um, yeah, you know, cardboard, Shiguru ban, yeah, cardboard you know. tubes, no, absolutely, very interesting. Any others? Very good. Yeah. Uh, you know, now, this is where we are. But we, okay. we got three interactions, both. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, because what I'm going to suggest is that there's uh, a source of inspiration of sustainable housing that is very easy to access to most of us living living in in um, South, Af South Africa. So I'm going to start with that, and then I'm going to go into just some quick um, examples. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I'm not going to give a lot of the evidence. I'm going to expect you to provide that in your competition entries, but it's it's really just to kind of show um, a set of ideas um, and um, <clears throat> really to kind of stimulate uh, thinking. So this, I'm actually going to, suggest that the most sustainable housing is actually indigenous um, settlements. Um, so if we look at villages in different parts of Southern Africa, they've been here for thousands of years uh, very successfully, um, and many generations have lived um, in, in those settlements. So this particular example is a village in Botswana, um, and you can see a lot of the kind of households uh, green space, animals graze here. Um, the hills aren't um, uh, occupied, and and then there's a there's a 
uh, a river wetland area and these settlements have have been around for a very long a very long time and the lands so you've got agriculture you've got uh, cattle posts um, and the systems work very well all the materials will have come from forests uh, the grass the thatch would have come uh, from the local areas and and these systems would just work um, very easily and very well for many thousands of years. Uh, we can look at figure ground drawings of this um, and you can start seeing the patterns. So you get uh, individual houses and then this free flow of space between. So you don't have this issue uh, of stormwater uh, management because uh, there's lots of porous paving. There's a very easy movement uh, in between housing. Um, and you have these green areas where there's uh, water flow, there's hills, uh, etc. So here's an example. Um, and next week, I think Francine will tell you a little bit more about the IKS lecture that we'll have next week, which will cover indigenous knowledge in, in a lot more uh, detail. But this is a typical example of a uh, house in Botswana. Uh, made out of mud, uh, smeared with cow dung, patterned uh, timber structure, uh, thatch roof. Um, the only two or three things that I imported here are a bit of tin for the cap uh, and the handle, the door handle. Uh, the door often might be made of local wood, uh, a local hardwood as, as well. And, and people live in these yards uh, very comfortably. There's shaded areas. Etc. This particular lady um, is just smearing her walls. Uh, the end of winter, ready for summer rains. So she, all the maintenance she does um, herself. Um, she uses ash, cow dung, a bit of clay, um, and adds a layer to to the building. You can see there's a skirting to throw water away from the main structural wall. Um, and there's a bit of an overhang so that you've got this uh, very well-maintained, sustainable um, structure. Um, very interesting, we start looking at um, the layouts. Um, so again, Botswana uh, housing will have a number of yards that, that really uh, look at, at privacy and, and public space. So there would be a main entrance, you'd come into the yard, you then have a lolwapa, which is semi-private. This is where uh, you might greet people, visitors would be entertained. Uh, you then have a number of huts, different members of the family. Um, but then behind it would be a lot of the kind of working aspects of life in terms of, of a kitchen, um, toilet, uh, keeping goats, chickens, uh, storage, uh, etc. Um, this shows the structure. So very simple timber uh, structure. All these materials would come from local areas, cut down with a simple axe, uh, put together. So a number of families might work together. There might be one or two men that are specialists at thatching, and they would be uh, asked to come in and do the thatching. Uh, the women might do the walls and the smearing, um, and you get a building in a very short space of time, two or three weeks. You get these very nice cool buildings. Uh, there's a gap at the top of the wall, so you get good airflow, um, very protected walls from rainfall, um, very warm in winter because you get low angle sunshine onto these walls, they re-radiate that heat into the space, very nice and warm in, in winter. And in summer, the sun is overhead um, and the space is very well shaded, very well insulated uh, by roofing structure. And then a lot of the belongings and the spatial arrangements internally um, work uh, in, inside the buildings. And what's happened is over time is they started off obviously being round, very simple structure, um, and then increasingly started changing as people saw modern urban housing. So you get uh, rectangular buildings, you get more of a veranda space um, around buildings, slightly bigger buildings, maybe partitioned, different rooms. Um, 
And if you do the analysis of these spaces, there's a kind of very clear hierarchy. So you go from this public space that everybody wanders around uh, into a courtyard. Um, and what you then have is the private space. So you get children, parents, married sons, maybe grandparents as well. And then behind it, you get other activities. So storage, uh, granaries, so mabele, the maize might be kept um, there and there might be a garden, et cetera. So this spatial hierarchy, very important to, to think through. And again, when we look at culture um, in your housing designs, you need to think this through and say, you know, how does this work? How are you going to set out these spaces so that um, a lot of the rituals, a lot of the interaction is very easy. It's very comfortable. Um, and, and people enjoy being in those spaces. They have parties, weddings, um, and it's very easy. And, and it's aligned to the culture. So that's a big question that you're going to need to tackle um, when you look at your designs. So how does this evolve? Um, one of the things that has started happening um, in a lot of villages is that they start from this open space um, where there's individual uh, housing and yards spread out, and then it's densified over time. So again, you might want to think about your settlement and say, you know, this is how it might evolve and develop um, and, and how you trigger that and how you shape that so that you build this density over time. It might not happen all at once or the funding might not be available for it to happen all at once. Um, and you can also think about, you know, affordability. So very nice question about affordability um, and, and finance. Many families have very limited finance. You know, they're struggling uh, paying school fees, they're paying uh, uniforms. So there's very little limited loose finance. Um, and the conventional urban life is you go to the bank and you ask for a, a loan, a bond, a mortgage. Um, and the, 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 the bank will say, what's your job? We need your pay slips. And they multiply it by three and they'll say, we'll lend you that. Um, and then they give you this loan over 25 years and you've got this enormous amount of money that you have to pay for 25 years. Um, but many people don't have formal jobs. So what do you do? Um, and there's interesting models. So this particular model is, is the idea of material banking, is that uh, someone might go to town, work, uh, go to the mines, uh, work on a farm, earn a bit of money, um, and have a little bit of excess money. And with that excess money, they buy materials. So three or four times a year, they buy blocks, they buy corrugated iron, uh, et cetera. Come December, they call their friends, they call a builder, or they do it themselves, and they build that room, that additional room. Um, and what that means is incrementally, um, you can build very substantial houses without any loans from the bank. Um, and so you never have this situation where the bank takes over your housing, you've got no money, you, et cetera. So again, think about the financial models and, and kind of how innovative you might want to um, explore different ways of, of financing um, housing and, and making it work and making it easy for, for um, people on very low incomes. Um, a lot of you will be familiar with uh, informal settlements. Um, so what you find is very innovative, um, industrious um, craftsmen, um, these two pictures is a church building I worked on in Philippi, uh, where they built this fantastic church, amazing light, uh, quite uncomfortable in the middle of the day, but at night with candles, um, very nice spaces. Um, and, and that was all done just with materials uh, that were available locally. Um, the picture below is uh, an entrepreneur in Botswana, um, which made prefabricated units. You literally could pick that up, put it in the back of a baki um, and take it to wherever you were going to uh, build it and, and use it. Um, so again, the skill here is to <clears throat> be able to manufacture something that's light enough to lift and carry and, and 
maybe only needs hand tools. So a lot of this would be made uh, under a tree, um, on a table with a saw, a hammer, nails, a uh, bit of some tin snips, uh, etc. Um, but you can create, you know, very attractive buildings. So this is a project I did also a couple of years ago, uh, really that built on that idea was, you know, could you develop a, a building in a box? Um, so a very simple structure, modular, bio-based uh, materials, um, and you make all of the panels, you use uh, pad foundations, um, and you then set out from the floor um, the whole structure. Um, and as a self-built project, very simply, um, each uh, component is could be easily uh, lifted, uh, fixed in sight. Um, you could quite easily and quite quickly build a full um, habitable house with solar panels, good ventilation, a little kitchen, a little toilet, um, etc. So again, when you look at self built this is what Francine talked about uh, at the beginning. Um, you need to demonstrate how this will work. Um, physically, what are the size of materials? How, how are things assembled? Where are they brought in? What do the foundations look like? Uh, how do you make it very affordable? How do you make it very easy uh, to build? <clears throat> um, unfortunately, we've got some uh, nice examples starting to appear uh, all over South Africa in terms of this tiny house uh, movement. Um, so these are examples from Rosemary Hill um, in Pretoria, uh, but there are many now in Cape Town, there are many in different areas. You, you, if you Google tiny house and your area, you probably will find some. Um, and the idea behind them is that they're very compact, simple buildings, very easy to build, maybe even move. So you can move it around um, and <clears throat> you provide everything you need. So they're under 35 square meters for two, two people. That's the kind of definition of a, uh, a tiny house um, and very minimal resources, much lower cost, uh, and also obviously much uh, cheaper to, to operate. Um, and there's a whole range of different ones that you can look at and, and you know provide very nice spaces so they can have a balcony um, so that you've got nice outside spaces, heating, much easier because the spaces are much smaller, very good daylighting, cross ventilation, a lot of bio-based uh, materials, uh, et cetera. Okay, the last couple, I'm gonna show now some bigger examples. So this is a project um, that I worked on uh, for human settlements, uh, really as an idea to explore how you could develop um, more dense housing. Um, so this particular example looked at uh, Alex. Um, and one of the kind of key things here was to look at the idea of using uh, some of the new business models. So the idea of um, um, crowdfunding um, and product as a service. Um, so not um, conventional structures where all the capital is built into the building. Um, you separate out a lot of the uh, elements and different people pay for those different elements. So I'll give a give bit more of an example in a little bit. Um, so one of the key things is very flexible, adaptable spaces. So you could have a particular module that could be doubled up for uh, slightly bigger families, uh, tripled up, um, you can have um, social spaces, you know, creches, gyms, um, commercial units at the bottom. I talked about very small rental units, um, and you can then distribute that and and have this very flexible uh, space. Um, so, building services uh, again. If you design buildings so that uh, the structure and the walls are built by one contractor and different entrepreneurs provided the other structures. So they provided a photovoltaic system and charged for that power. Another one provided a solar hot water system and charged for the liters of hot water. Um, another provided, for instance, a gray water system um, and charged for gray water to flush toilets. 
what that means is it means the capital of all of those systems can be paid for by an entrepreneur. Um, and those systems will then be maintained and looked after uh, by entrepreneurs who charge a very small amount um, on for each unit that's used. Um, and in that way, you create a whole network of local entrepreneurs um, that maintain your buildings uh, at a very high level of, of service um, and you have a lower capital cost. Um, so it's one way of getting around a lot of the issues in terms of management of, of social housing is, is by outsourcing um, and having product as a service um, entrepreneurs that maintain um, and upgrade uh, a lot of the equipment and services within buildings. So yeah, here's here's the example of that. And it may, it may be that you have a whole set of entrepreneurs. So also food, um, childcare, uh, mobility in terms of, of uh, uh, movement around uh, the site to other sites, uh, et cetera. So you create this symbiosis of different uh, systems. The last one I'm going to talk about is a circular economy um, approach we developed this um for um the world circular economy forum um and really that the idea here is that uh you build a very simple uh, structural frame um it could be made of concrete timber steel ideally timber um and then you have infill panels uh, again um you then can use different contractors and different um, manufacturers uh, because it's much smaller scale. You've already built the large scale expensive structure um, and you can then adapt and change that very easily internally. Um, and then you build your different layers in terms of facades, solar shading, um, fenestration, your horizontal vertical circulation, and on the roof, you then uh, look at energy systems, food garden systems, um, et cetera. So very simple, by pulling everything apart, you have that Stuart brand design that enables you, A, to put it together very easily using different uh, entrepreneurs, but also repair it, maintain it, adapt it. Um, so, using a modular approach, you can then have a whole range of kind of different uses uh, within uh, the space. Um, and, and really also think about how that works within a, a neighborhood, within a city, so that you have your food systems, you have water systems, mobility systems, um, and really it's an ecosystem um, of products and services that enable you to live very sustainable uh, living uh, and working uh, patterns um, and, and very social. So these are some of the diagrams we, we developed uh, for the, the project. Um, I think that's it. Good. All right, Francine, I'm now... You, bravo, bravo. Done, done. <laughs> okay. Well done. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so I think that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's it. I have a very interesting question um, yeah. from Jeremy here. Um, in terms of spatial transformation, to what end must our ideas explore or encapsulate this concept? And my first answer will be, some of you will absolutely run with this concept and some of you won't. Some of you will partially look at it. Um, but if you feel comfortable with it, run with it all the way. That would be my answer. But I don't expect that all the projects will. Prof. Jeremy? I, I think before I look at that particular aspect is is that um, we are deliberately throwing a lot of ideas at you, um, but um, you you must be selective. You choose you know what inspires you, what you want to explore, mm -hmm. what you want to take as as a skill that you develop and share later. So I think don't try and do everything, um, but pick. Um, an area that you are excited about or you want to learn about um, and then do it very thoroughly. Almost push it to the limit, um, then take it back a little bit if you need to, if it gets a bit extreme. <laughs> um, 
but I I think um yeah it's it's the idea with this project is about ideas and it's about exploring um and we want some new new thinking um that's what you know is going to come through um in terms of the way projects are judged um and also we will want to share new thinking we heard uh, last week you know that human settlements is quite interested in piloting and exploring things and where we see really good projects and ideas, uh, even if they're not totally refined and finished, um, we're, what we'll try and do is we'll try and share them with relevant people, um, systems, technologies, um, government, manufacturers, etc. Really to kind of create, um, you know, a bit of change and um, innovation. The Do you want to all switch, switch your switch your switch your cameras on? Um, yeah, unmute let's, yourself. Switch yeah. your cameras on. <laughs> so, um, feel free. Uh, it's it's. Uh, no. I've been talking a lot. It's uh, you know. Do feel free to to also ask questions. Are there a few more in the chat? Uh, let's see. N nothing yet, but I just want to say every single time a student asks a question or a lecturer asks a question, everyone learns. Everyone yeah. has another idea or so please do go ahead unmute yourself or write it in the chat put your camera on should you wish what do people think of the site is it an easy site difficult site i think it's a difficult site <laughs> i think I think this is probably more more difficult than last year's project. Yeah, I, last I year's agree. Site was, oh. Last year's I site agree. was an open site. It was surrounded by amenities. It didn't have um. You, we didn't have to look at real lines between the past, between the here and the there about uh, segregation, you know, and also to to work with a site where there are already people living. It's extremely difficult. Um, so these questions, these few questions we've had, it's very interesting. And it, it goes to show you're on the right track. Those of you who have been brave enough to make a comment, you're on the right track. Um, Anyone else brave enough? <laughs> yes, here, ah, here we go. We Ma'am, with regards to the contours and the existing municipal sewer lines, is there uh, in the Google Drive? The currently you only have an area view from the top, and you have the first PowerPoint that um, a senior lecturer from Nelson Mandela presented at Headquarter. But I would not be too concerned with municipal sewer lines and exact contours. I would, or at least last year's submissions focus more on ideas. So yes, do respond to the site, but don't be too um, restricted by by height limitations or so on and so forth. I also thought about that that railway. Come here, if like I said last week, if you only approach one hectare of the site, that's fine as opposed to 10. But should you move a bit here or a bit there, it won't be the end of the world. Just in your submission, say what you've done. Hmm. You know, have I, a diagram, communicate it. Yeah, I think the other thing, I mean, as Francine mentioned, I think um, it's choosing choosing your focus. Um, because I think the other point Francine made is that the idea of a kind of unit, you know, how, how do these spaces work? You know, what's a unit? How big is it? Is a unit multi- person is it multifamily you know how do how do these things work how do they stack up and and um you know are they uh, organized etc so um you know how do you how do you design those spaces no yeah, absolutely so some of you will be working on a very large urban scale some of you will be working on a unit scale some of you will be working a bit on each some of you might focus the whole group on one part or give everyone in the group a different role. 
to present a different part of the ideas. But I, I think after today as well, there are so many ideas. There are so many ideas that you can apply to this site, to this brief, to trying to achieve these densities. Um, at the end of the day, a well-presented, well-resolved idea goes very far, you know, rather than too many minds. The, the other thing is, um, you know, hopefully what you take from some of these workshops, some of these ideas, is something that, you know, you find interesting or exciting. So um, the architects that have specialized in social um social housing um community architecture um and they don't sit in an office <laughs> you know they spend their time um doing self build projects out with communities um etc you know using local materials etc the other architects you know that get fascinated with you know energy modeling um, and you know they they use a really good understanding of local climate, um, what happens in the building when people cook, um, movement when there's hot water required, etc. Um, to design these incredibly efficient um, housing, and it's you know it's all modeled, and you know we can show the energy consumption, the water consumption over. 24 hours, uh, et cetera. And we can show the activities um, and, and what happens at different times of the year. So part of what we are wanting is, is for you to um, hopefully get you know, inspired, interested in a particular area, and then just go for it. Um, you know, really explore um, you know, where this takes you. I agree. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay. Students and lecturers and everyone online, what is the chance that we could do a, a screenshot with everyone smiling on their cameras? Last time we tried <laughs> it, you were all extremely shy. So I don't know if you're already in your pajamas or if you're, <laughs> if you're you know, in bed with a face mask on, <laughs> seeing us already 10 to 6. Shall yeah, we it is, give it it's a about time. Is anyone, or shall we try it for the last workshop? Let's see. Well, we, yeah, Maybe we could we try it. Maybe, do you want to okay. talk about the next, the last one? Um, yeah. yeah. Folks, the next workshop is the last workshop. Then it is um, shoulder to the wheel. Then you have a few weeks, five weeks left until you submit. So the next workshop, we will, our main sponsor, the NHBRC and Isaac Bartley will give an very, very interesting um, a presentation on the work that they do on innovative um, technologies and building systems. And we will also look at indigenous knowledge systems. Um, and then we will have questions. Any questions you have regarding submission, regarding problems you might have, questions you might have, that will be the time to ask as well next week. Um, and then, then we are done. Then if you have any questions, you email me to the website on the, the brief you will speak directly to me if there's anything that I can't help you with I will revert to, to Prof Jeremy as well and the rest of the team Prof Sujukule, even Prof PD. so um, yeah, we're almost there we're almost there and you might, this is a dodgy part of a design is always the start and the process so you might feel very insecure very discouraged but if you just go through the process I know that magic will come out of this we were so impressed by the students last year, you know, which is another reason I don't want lecturers to take part. I don't want you to embarrass the lecturers because your work was just so good last year. It was fantastic. So just, yeah, shoulder to wheel. Yeah, everybody's wearing a face mask. <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> this, no, no one's going to show themselves. <laughs> you'll have to, yeah. you'll have to uh, tell Jeremy, everybody. Thank you get... so much. Get ready for for the la for the last workshop. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone, Put on your makeup. Get a haircut. Put on your makeup. I'll also get I'll also <laughs> get a haircut. Um, yeah, but thank you very much to everyone that joined once again. I see that there are no more questions. There are no more hands up. So, Prof. Jeremy, to you as well. Thank you so very much. It was an education.
and yeah, thank you so very much for tonight. And then we'll see everyone next week. Lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thank Ciao. you. Cheers, bye -bye. everyone. Bye-bye.